we interrupt this regularly scheduled podcast for an important program announcement. We're back. <laughs> You've heard us say it many times before, y'all. The things that you can definitely control on your elk hunt are your effort and your attitude. But what about those things most elk hunters say are out of their control? Things like the weather, area conditions, elk activity, how an elk behaves, moon phase, hunting pressure, or other hunters jumping into your play. What about when your setup is perfect, but the dead gum bull decides to go the wrong way? These things are all things we've experienced or are gonna experience on an elk hunt. But what if you're told that none of those are truly out of your control? Wanna know why? Want to know how to control the uncontrollable? Well, y'all, come on into Old Elk Bros Elk Camp, and let's just talk about that. That discussion, some Elk Bros shout outs, questions from our Elk Bros mailbox, and today you're going to meet the newest Elk Bros coach. So my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by elkbros.com, with your host, elk hunting coach, Joe Gilly. You want to hunt elk? They live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons, doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello there, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy our show. And as always, for those blue collar hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host of your show, coming to you from Spring, Texas. And y'all, I hope you are ready for this because we got a full house tonight. Elk Bros coaches, old and new, for our first show back. And from the Katy, Texas area, that's right, the leader of the Venezuelan mafias in the house. And from Burnett, Texas, the Flatlander himself and elk calling champion of Texas, Cole Wilkes. And from <laughs> Cuesta, New Mexico, that's right, the living legend himself, R.C. Knox is in the house. And from Cimarron, New Mexico, your elk hunting coaches, Leroy the Ninja Chavez, and that's right, WWJGD. <laughs> What would Joe Gillian do? He's in the house tonight. What's up, fellas? What's oh, up, brother? What's uh, happening? What up? <laughs> and I miss your ugly mugs. <laughs> <laughs> We're back. I think introductions are in order, Joe. Yes, sir. Introductions. So everybody recognize that face. Now, if you see RC Knox popping in and out, and for you guys that oh. don't, uh, you, you don't remember what RC looks like, you can always go down to the Quest of Post Office and look for that poster <laughs> up on the side of the <laughs> He he is here to talk with us, but that's that's not right. <laughs> ah, there he is. <laughs> oh, there you oh go. in and out. In and out. Oh, boy. I think RC said, you know, these folks can only take so much beauty at one time. You know, so. that's right. <laughs> so let's let's get these introductions, man. Let's introduce our newest Elk Bros coach um right here in the and, and what was that chiva what what was what was the name of the that uh your, your chiva town new mexico and las cruces so that's where i grew up so shout yeah. out to all my family in chiva town so yeah they were a bunch of goat herders and, uh, so, <laughs> that's why they call them chivo yeah, that's why it's called yeah. chiva town yeah i'll have to take yeah. a picture of the plaque and show it to you guys but there that's you an, an official place so Welcome. Guys, this is Eric Aragon out of Las Cruces, New Mexico, Chiva Town, man. Gilbert is planning on making a visit. He has some goats to hug. <laughs> I was going nowhere. I man, you, about you stole goats. my thunder, man. I was just, I was going to go there. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. You hug one, you paint the Sistine Chapel. Do they call you Michelangelo? Hell no. But you hug one goat and you're going to be a goat hugger forever. <laughs> So, Eric, tell everybody a little bit about yourself so they can get to know you. Yeah, hey, listen, uh, just a guy that loves the elk hunt. And uh, growing up here in Las Cruces, hunted a lot down in the south, uh, chasing Gila monsters for a long time. Uh, got introduced to hunting through my grandfather, my dad. And uh, I took up bow hunting um, just 
I had Mr. gone on a hunt. Yeah, I'd gone on a hunt with a guy, and uh, we were listening to a Primo's video or uh, audio, and he threw a call at me and said, "Hey, think you can do that? Because I can't make this diaphragm work." I said, "Well, let me see that stupid thing," and I did. And uh, next thing I know, I was calling for these guys. I had no idea what I was doing, but I could make that. I can make that diaphragm work, and I called in a bull and. They didn't know what to do, but they missed. And uh, but I was after that. I was like, I'm getting me a bow, and I'm gonna start getting this on. And Nothing so it's like been it. trial and error, and I've been doing it for quite a while. You know, had some years where I wasn't able to hunt, but uh, you know, it's just been a, a learning process for myself. I've always been the guy that's kind of taking the lead in that and calling and setting up the hunts and things like that. So uh, for myself, it's more of uh, yeah, I love killing them. But I really love to call for others. I love the excitement of helping somebody experience something they've never done in their lifetime. So that's way uh, cool. Yeah. But uh, awesome. I got introduced to you guys through just, I was bouncing through some podcasts a couple of years ago and I saw this name, Elk Bros. I'm like, okay, I got to check this out. They name Scott Bros. That's like family Listen, right I there. Catch up. It was. And I was hooked ever since. And I've just been a big fan. I love your guys' show. And uh, I'm always listening to it, always learning. So, uh, I just feel honored, man. I get to help some folks through your guys' welcome platform. to the brotherhood. Very, you're Thank very you. welcome. Yeah, there, welcome. Eric. Man, and welcome, I can't Eric. help I can help to see a lot of similarities here. I mean, I hear his story, and it's just like Manano's story with a diaphragm. I mean, <laughs> Manano's been with a diaphragm for about maybe five years, and uh, yeah, still ah. not even able to make a single sound. So uh, he yeah. can, but all the cats <laughs> in the world come to me. I promise you. This guy grabs it one day and calls in a bull for his friends. Was like, yeah, just like Manano. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing, and you guys. I can tell you, um, one of the things that put Eric on the radar with the elk bros and and one thing that we find out as hunters is we find out that a lot of us are cut from the same cloth. And when I heard Eric's story, and you guys remember this yes. in in our last season there what when Eric mm -hmm. um, actually took time out of his hunt, had come across a young man and his little brother that were hunting. And instead of being the guy, you know, when they were talking about how they were having a difficult time, instead of being that guy that said, yeah, there's no elk here, blah, 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 because it's his hunt area. And he was doing that. He was like, you know, he recognized the struggle. He saw the young man, he saw his little brother and he wanted those guys to have success and he took time out of his hunt took them to where he knew bulls were at called in a bull and they they got it done man and yeah they did oh what a story that was eric it was just awesome bud yeah hey it yeah. was a blast i mean they they blew my set up and uh <laughs> it's one of them things that it wasn't intentional it just one of those sure. things that happened and happens yeah, so I, you know, I'm just that kind of guy. I'm like, well, hey, if you guys want to join me, I know the area. I'm actually, I'll take you to my honey hole. Let's see if we can get you a bull. I know you paid a lot of money. Let's take some. I'm by myself. The weather's really hot. Uh, I can't get as far back as I normally like to go because I'm not going to be able to get a bull out of here by myself. Let's see what I can do for you, you know. And yeah. man, that that afternoon. So For all awesome, those man. listeners listening, that's Eric Aragon and Las Cruces. His phone number is if he's going to take you to his honey hole. <laughs> that's right. Hey, yeah, buddy. No, bud. But I mean, think about that. You know, this show today is about controlling the uncontrollable. And one of the things mm. we're going to talk about, and so we want to pull this back up, is when other hunters jump into your setup, into your, you know, into your play. I think it's happened to us every year, huh, Joe? Yeah. And, and it happens. You still have to move. Well, and it's happened to it. where we jump in somebody else's setups. Too. It, 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 yeah. it is. Yeah. But you know, but is it possible to control Manano though? Is that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it kind of depends on how much Francesco, man, it's it's that's been happening. Francella. <laughs> yeah. Francelico. Yeah. 
Yeah, Fran. There you go, Frangelico, yeah. man. Francesca ever shows up, you're gonna have to hold Manano <laughs> down. I promise. <laughs> oh, good. And, and you guys can tell. I mean, for all of our listeners out there, you've got to meet Cole Wilkes. Now you've got yeah, to meet Aragon. Um, you know, I'm not going to say a whole lot about, you know, Luis and I mean, we can only go so far, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I surround and our goal is to surround ourselves with great people. If you want to do great things, surround yourself with great people. I can tell you this as a track coach. I was the smartest track coach in New Mexico because I went and found the smartest track coach and made him coach with me. So, Hey, if you want to do great things, find great people. And I just wanted to, one thing we've never talked about and so that you guys can do it is, is really, I'm, I want to talk publicly for the first time about, the coaching staff aspect because people are seeing this and my elk bros vision and my goal is to develop a hand-picked elk bros trained and certified coaching staff and i want that staff utilized for elk bro seminars for webinars for live uh training camps remote training sessions i want to see at some point here the ability for hunters all over the West to be able to hire and have an Elk Bros trained coach or coaching team in camp with them, man. And, and look, I'm not saying as a guide, <laughs> this is not guiding, man. What this is about is because they're not going to be calling in Elk or telling you what to do. They Teaching. are a coach. They're a teacher a consultant, if you will, <clears throat> corporation, you wanted to be a better court, right? Um, you know, shoot, they might even be a fellow hunter with you in camp you know so um that's kind of the way that we want it we want to facilitate not make decisions but to empower others to make decisions by learning the variables and the possibilities they will be coaching and helping them to get to another level as an elk hunter that's the vision and we want it to happen at live elk bros training camps we want it to happen on seminars we want to help other people raise their game in a whole different way. And RC Knox, RC, we talked about this, right? Right. And, you know, RC has been a guide for how many years, Guy? Oh, since I was uh, 12. I started guiding when years, I was 12. Man, that's a long time, bro. <laughs> 82 <laughs> years, man. I thought you're 94 now. <laughs> and I can tell you when, you know, when I when talked to RC and RC first heard about all this, you know, being an, an outfitter and elk guide is a totally different thing, you know. And now I love guiding, but I've never been a point and shoot guide. I've always been a teaching guide. And that's where all of this came from right. as far as that, because you guys threw that idea out there and um thus this is developed and i see yeah. this becoming something special i see this well i mean I, I, no doubt we've been pushing joe for the vision for the last oh three or four months to see what that vision was and you know we're down i mean we're gonna follow you till it falls off the face of the earth joe so um, it's very exciting what's coming up and what we have in the wings and stuff like that, that could materialize. I mean, it's going to be really cool to be part of this. And, um, I'm very blessed to have such great men around me to be part of this. Oh, absolutely, man. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, if like, for example, Cole, and that was one thing when I saw Cole's, if you guys haven't been to his Flatlander, uh, YouTube channel, you're missing out because Cole is a true teacher man yeah he is somebody that is out there to make other people better he puts people ahead of himself but he's very passionate about hunting and this guy has hunting on his mind 24 7 i don't think there's anybody here <laughs> really <does. laughs> yeah. uh, on that cole and eric will be our hunt wars coaches in camp and the hunt wars teams have been selected the remote training sessions have begun i started today today was our meet and greet got to meet the boys got to meet the fellas uh we started talking about coaching points we're doing that so my my role is i'm going to be training until they get to camp and then at camp they get turned over to eric and cole and 
Eric and Cole's job is to um, facilitate, man, to be there. And they are going to, their goal is to help those, every single one of those fellas be successful. And if they're successful, we've done our job. And Absolutely. yeah, so uh, it is so cool and it's so exciting, right? Joe, have, yeah. they de- have they decided what success looks like? Is it an, a shot opportunity or is it a, a bull down or, I mean. They have, have a scoring done? system. They have a scoring system. Oh, they do. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so on the hunt wars, and that's one thing that, that attracted to me. And if you, if you guys have never listened to Troy talk about hunt wars, um, he fits right in with this group, man. I mean. Yeah. He yeah. could be in here with us right now. Have, have listened to him. Yeah, man. Yeah. He's a teacher. He's passionate. Mm-hmm. He wants to see people be successful, but he wants responsible, ethical, quick yeah. kills. Um, yeah. And that's the way that system shows that. Even though, you know, when people hear a hunting competition, they think it's about whack them and stack them, and that's not it at yeah. all. Yeah. And, you know, their scoring system, of course, um, has to do with gross score, but it also has to do with, you're trying the more mature you take an animal, the higher age. your score because that age and age distance is going to give you double on the score. And yeah. then you get scored if you shoot, if you take a shot to get an animal and you do take an animal over yeah. 40 yards, it you are ducks. penalized yeah. according yeah. to the amount of distance you go out there, which is again encouraging that close, quick kill. And I, I just sure. love that. And I, I love what it represents. So that's real exciting. And, and I have no doubt because, you know, these guys that you're seeing here that are with our core right now are guys that I have spent time communicating with, evaluating with them having no clue what was in the plan. And, yeah. and it got to a point where I was like, let me talk to you about this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, glad to have both you guys, man. And I think you guys are going to love being together. Yeah, super excited, man. This what a huge opportunity and just, you know, to be able to, you know, it's it moves me every day to hear these guys and I get I get I'm getting emails and people messaging me all the time now. The, you know, my channel is just exploding and it's I think it's because, you know, I I am out there teaching people and they and that's what I love about this whole concept. It's just I think it's going to be su- super awesome. Um, you know, and me and Eric have talked on the phone. It's going to be super cool to be out there and help these guys and be able to break down their day, you know, every day. Yep. Absolutely. You know, talking to the guys today, we're like, so how's it going to work? Are they going to be in the field? You know, and we'll talk about that when that comes up, but no, they're, you guys aren't out in the field. They come back to camp. And what's cool about this is everything's videoed. You can almost check the tape like a football coach does and, and, and go and find out, you know, what happened during the play and then have those conversations, man. It's, it's just like watching tape, which uh, is, is way cool. Did you know, Joe, how many camera people they'll have with them as they are, you know, hunting? No, I don't. I couldn't tell you. I'd be lying. I, I, that's above my pay scale. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure exactly how many they have out there. So a good question uh, to ask though. Yeah. And, and they're going to have four teams in the field. So right. you're and teams of two, right? Yeah. So what you do is you have a caller and you have a shooter. You have a caller and you have a shooter. Right. Right. And the shooter is the person that won the, won the, the draw. <laughs> not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. Yeah. They can pick. Yeah. They can swap okay. if they want. They, mm-hmm. they could they could have a buddy they want to be shooter and they yeah. can decide to be the caller. So. Oh, they can they can swap during the hunt. It's no. not the same. No, no. no, they got a designated prior yeah. to. Right. Okay. So yeah. if if they won the hunt wars, they can uh-huh. let their partner be the shooter and they can decide to be the I caller. I gotcha. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely cool. And uh, we have two teams from um got two teams from Wyoming, one team from Idaho, and a team from Arizona. And all great fellows, man. They're they're really cool. There's two of them I haven't met in person, and they kind of had me a little bit because, you know, they listen to the podcast and they've seen us already. So they, it's like they knew me already, and I'm trying to learn them, yeah, and, uh, figure them out. Yeah, yeah, that was a fun part. Of it. So has has all of them have all of them heard our podcast before, Joe? I I don't know if all of them have, but I believe uh, most of them have. Yeah. Cool. And cool. all of them um, were given a free 
um, year subscription to the academy. Oh man, so that's they're awesome, going man. through the academy, and then they're getting they're getting that training with me as well. So, awesome. and, and like I told those guys, man, take advantage of this. Cause most guys that get to get with me are paying to do it. So yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Yeah, no doubt. that's a hell of a nature hike. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's have some fun, man. Let's have some fun. Absolutely. Oh, and, uh, and expensive. Guys, y'all know what time it is. It's time for our Elk Bros shout out. Shout out. Shout out. Shout out. Shout out. These are shout outs to a few cities <laughs> with the most listeners topping our charts this week. Yes, sir. First, we want to thank, and man, I tell you, we took that month off. And we had people cranking some reviews in, man. I think we're going to have to take a month off more often because cool. the reviews are coming in, man. That was way cool. So we want to thank those folks giving us incredible reviews on Apple Podcasts and iTunes. Oh, and I got one today that was from Podbean. Um, and it's one of our people on our hunting, but he didn't give us his name. But I can probably go in and find the picture. But he, he was really giving us a good review. And he said... He listened to the one show and he said, I, I guess I'm going to have to take Luis's advice and follow him around. So that's what, uh, <laughs> uh, that was his review. So I want to thank G-Dog. G-Dog says going, he's listened to the show and he says going elk hunting now. He said, good old boys, I'm home. He found our oh. podcast and he was pretty excited. Frankie, Frankie titled his review, he said, professional and personable. Well, no, I'm like, I think he meant to go to one of those other podcasts, man. He's missing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think he got the wrong one. Yeah, yeah. He wrote, he, he probably confused, got confused and wrote the review on the wrong podcast. Yeah, no, that that's the Western Contours podcast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Drew B. Listen to this, y'all. Drew B., this boy is down 50 pounds since January. He wants oh, to- ah, Congrats, Drew. Um, yeah, I, I, picked, I picked those pounds back up for <laughs> oh, you. Yeah. No, I don't think yeah. Greg Crook, the Arizona outlaw. Uh, Greg, we appreciate you, man, all the nice things you said about us. Next chapter, uh, and next chapter, guy, we will be waiting for that story, brother, because he, he listened to one of the moments that he did, and he, he enjoyed the moment, and uh, and he said he can't wait to tell us his story. So, Oh, that's ooh. cool. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Yeah, I like that episode of The Moment, Joe. I really liked it. That very was good. Very well oh, done. Very good. Yeah. Oh, I, heard, I think you've done two now, right? Yes, sir. The one that came yeah. out. The, the other two. one's fantastic as well, Joe. I just heard the first really one. I haven't good. heard the other one. So the other the one's about that hunt. Get on the ball, Luis. I know. The other, one's about, the, hunt. the other one's about the hunt we did with Trey Kistler, and it was fantastic. Yeah, and so it was when me and Chav were, were hunting out there before. In the burn, baby. The burn, baby. That was uh, burn me twice right there. Right. Burn, <laughs> baby, burn. Shout really out to good. Chris from Helena, man. Thanks, Chris. We each feel, guy, that if we are not working to make this better, um, and cause he was talking about how he appreciated us talking about etiquette and our responsibilities and, and those types of things. And guy, if we don't do that, if we don't use this to be able to promote that, then we're part of the problem. So we sure appreciate you recognize that. And Joel from Germantown, Wisconsin, buddy, uh, he watched the moment and, uh, or listened to it. I think he did watch it. <clears throat> Who doesn't love the sound of campfire and crickets? So that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a really cool, uh, shot too, that you can watch on YouTube and it's kind of the side shot from our camp and, yep. uh, then the fire mm-hmm. crackling, man, it's pretty good stuff, Joe. I got to give it to you. Oh, thanks, man. Um, Oh, uh, before we, um, before we go too far, guys, I know that, this podcast was supposed to be us completing our top 10 failure point series. Um, and that's going to happen. That's on the agenda. Now we just wanted to break it up with some other content. Um, and we still have some other collaborative shows, uh, shows done with other hosts that we're going to share as well. So we still have plenty of content to come in. So, um, we're glad to be back. You're going to hear us. You're going to hear us with other people. You're going to hear a, a, a lot of cool things. I'm excited about this upcoming season as well. Also, remember, if you can be part of our show by sending us a 15 to 20 second shout out video um, by just sending it to me through a message, text, email, you can email it to me at joe at elkrose.com and then we'll get you on the show as well. We want you to be part. This is y'all's show. That's why we're here. I mean, 
that's why Eric is here. That's why Cole is here because they were once listeners. And like we said, this is y'all show and they're perfect example of that right there, man. So yeah, as many, as many guys as I talk to on the phone, Joe, <laughs> you guys uh, take a little video of yourself and send it to me and I can send it to Joe or whatever. Uh, yeah, post it yeah. on our Instagram page. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. So now for our top listening cities, Chav, you knocked it out. Okay. Uh, this week's top listening city is a suburb of Omaha, Nebraska, established in the 1870s, named after a creek or crick, how some people say it, a creek that flows through the center of town. It was given by French explorers and is derived from the French word for butterfly Sometimes referred to as Papio by its residents, it is also the home to the Kansas City's Royals AAA club, the Storm Searchers. And this is Papillion, Nebraska. Papillon. Papillon, Nebraska. I, now, you all really confused me. See, I thought, I mean, it took me years to, to be able to pronounce Creek. Now you're saying I can say Crick? No, that's only them people from the north of the Mason-Dixon say Crick. <laughs> hey, man, you guys can't keep confusing me like that, man. It's just No difficult. offense to the people north of the Mason-Dixon, but that's how they say it. They say Crick. <laughs> yeah, in the west, it's Creek. Yeah. Wow. Down here in the south, it's Creek, too. Yeah, and uh, according to the... Uh, the uh, uh, yahoo.com pronunciation they did say papillion instead of papillon oh really? i like it i i like it chad yeah. will put it in your face like <laughs> hey i have already done my homework fellas yahoo. Hey, <laughs> yahoo guys our next top listening city is known as the hot dog capital of the world my wife loves hot dogs she'd be going crazy <laughs> there and also the fireworks capital of of america it's chili dogs are the product of greek immigrants and pyrotechnico fireworks company actually started there in italy in 1889 before the vitali family migrated to the u.s and since then has been awarded the world's most prestigious fireworks venues like the presidential celebrations and the super bowls this is in none other than newcastle pennsylvania newcastle pennsylvania newcastle is in the house in the house you know i i you know, I am Italian, so I can do this, but, you know. Uh, oh, I, here we go again. <laughs> I know one that's not a family man that in Italy, man, that became experts in explosives, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I actually, I actually have a couple, uh, a couple, of, I actually know two friends, different families, Italian descent with a last name. Italian, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they actually came over in 1920 through Ellis Island and went to Newcastle, Pennsylvania with that business and the rest was history, man. Some went, apparently some went to Venezuela too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this top listening city is part of the Savannah, Georgia metropolitan area. And it was once named after a railroad stop called Pooler Station. So during the American Civil War, Union General William Tecumseh Sherman negotiated Savannah surrender at this location. And for those grinders looking to fly your own jet to your happy hunting grounds next year, Gulfstream Aerospace, one of the largest manufacturers of private jets in the United States, is located here. So a big grinder shout out to Pooler, Georgia. Pooler, Georgia. Pooler, Georgia. And you not only get good people, good quality hunters, great callers, the guys can freaking read, and now I have to read. <laughs> yeah. I, I can barely read. I can, read. Know, I can barely read. And then now I have to read after him. It's just like I'm gonna look oh, completely man. dumb right now. I was like, man, he didn't give me any sunny beaches to do or anything <laughs> like that. So you're gonna be all right, son. Hey, Savannah, Georgia, man, that that place is awesome Beautiful. to go. Tice to go to uh, Olympic weightlifting competitions there in the Masters Division, man, and yeah. we would. I would have to starve myself to make weight. But once I got on the platform after the weigh-ins, man, we'd head down into Savannah and just eat some of that rich Southern food. Yeah, man, man, I'd blow up about 10 pounds by the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. And I actually, I've gotten to shoot with two of our bros uh, uh, here in the last week. I got to shoot with Eric down at Hit or Miss Archery in Albuquerque. 
and that was mm-hmm. a great time, man. Uh, it was really great to to do that together. And uh, and guys, I was shooting with Chav yesterday. And I don't know, man. Oh, Chav, how <laughs> is that shooting dog. coming along? No pictures, man. What the heck? No hey. pictures. <laughs> Look, uh, at fifty yards. At fifty yeah. yards, this dude is. I told you, man. Man, I told like, you that bow was bad to the bone. Yeah. If you can hold it on it, it will do it. Oh, let me tell you, Chad Very is rocking, nice. man. I mean, a whole different. Uh, and, and I and I was just talking to a buddy of mine, Max, um, up in Pueblo, and and Max, a great guy. Max is trying to help us out all kinds with our hunt coming up. And Max was like, Joe, man, if if uh, if Chab needs a, a crossbow, I've got one dialed in for Colorado. It's all set up. I was like, Jeez, dude, <laughs> you don't need no crossbow, man. This dude's clicking right now. So, <laughs> oh, that's, cool. Chav. that's still hey, shooting down though. So that's awesome. Hey, shout out to you, Luis. I was shooting those bombs that I made after watching your video. So Joe got a chance to see those things flying. They hit like hammers. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. how much did they weigh? About 565. I was oh, jumping. yeah. Yeah, they were way yeah, heavier. Yeah. But him and I are shooting the V, man. I'm loving that thing. Oh, yeah. that's one step I'm I just being afraid to make, man. I'm probably next year. Me we'll too. See. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. One of the things that I did today when I was shooting, I went back to my old uh, VAPs just to see how they flew out of my bow shooting with that. And I could drop in. I could jump up to like a 290 or a 300, no problem. Just pop it right in there and not – my arrow's flying exactly the same. I don't have Thanks. any change there. It's just, man, it's a nice tool. So I'm loving it. And then the last thing I'd say about it is I'm left eye dominant. And I'm shooting right-handed. Mm-hmm. And so if I don't close Makes that eye, yeah. uh, if I don't uh, close that eye and I get that Vitalakis, yeah, my arrow's yeah. gonna my arrow will fly to the right if I try to shoot with both eyes open. I learned that. So yeah. Yeah. this piece, man, I got that sight window. It's beautiful. That's it so cool. Really it's kind of like how Joe shoots with a decoy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we see hey, that dude, you, you you ask Eric what was happening. <laughs> we were shooting unmarked. 3ds back to i don't know 56 i guess uh, everything yeah. between everything unmarked and i was shooting with that v and let him know eric what was happening man he was I just got him in up. i just got him in up and do it man i'm just i'm just too freaking like like square you know i just i need to let go <laughs> of that and then just you know he fine. will he'll figure out something out engineer what y'all are doing i promise you <laughs> yeah but anyway All thanks right. luis no, you're very welcome, brother. I'm glad that's working for you, man. We'll we'll continue to to try new things. So up next, the city occupies the east shore of Rock Lake in Wisconsin, and was one named was once named Tyranina, which means sparkling waters. One of the top attractions in the in this area is the Astalon State Park the site of an ancient Mississippian settlement that thrived in the 10th and 13th century. This, in, the indigenous, this indigenous people built a massive pyramid-style mounds, and uh, the local legend suggests that they were actually built by the Aztecs. In so Lake Mills, Lake Mills, Wisconsin. Wow, man. That's Thank way you. north for yeah, Aztecs, yeah. but oh, interesting for sure. theory for sure. It's crazy. Yeah. Absolutely, right, man. Is that Astalon? Is that what, how you would pronounce that park? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Astalon, Astalon. and then yeah. Tyranina. RC, yeah. you were you were yeah. here back when the Aztecs were here, bro. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Yeah. Hello, bro. Yeah, I was here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was here. It's like, yeah, that's why I'm so much wiser than y'all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Wisdom. <laughs> cool. all right y'all uh last but not least this top listening city is known as the salad bowl of the world for its large vibrant agriculture industry uh located just eight miles from the pacific ocean and has a coastal climate perfect for farming it's in the hometown of writer john steinbeck who set many of his uh, stories, including East of Eden, right here. The city's name actually derives from the nearby salt marshes, Salinas, California. Salinas, California. 
Man, we mm. just went all the way across the United States. Cali in the house. That is cool, man. Uh, yeah, you got Nebraska, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Wisconsin, California. Yeah, Amazing. we just rocked the United States right there. Guys, thank That's you cool. so much, man. Uh, sure appreciate our listeners out there. And so let's jump into the topic of tonight's show. I got, I know we got a lot of people going, y'all quit talking about all this crap and get to the topic. So <laughs> yeah, get to the right. chase. So the topic tonight, man, elk hunting and controlling the uncontrollable. And the reason that this came up is that I've heard, and, and we talk about, we say it ourselves. The only two things that you control is your attitude and your effort. But you know, I start hearing people talking about how they're subject to all of these things that are uncontrollable while they're hunting that ends up causing their hunt to be unsuccessful. And and I really got to thinking about this. And then I was talking to one of our listeners that sent in a letter, and we're going to talk about that question in a second. But he was asking a particular question. And as I thought about it, I was like, you know, why is it in life that we feel out of control? And it's, it's really when, and, and all of us have been there, when something happens, a given situation that we don't know how to react to, we're not ready for it. We get confused, we get disoriented, we don't know which way to turn, and we find ourselves without options. So that's the key, that last part of it right there. I really no think options. that's, yeah, no options. So, and- and this is what I want every one of our listeners to hear is that we talk about elk hunting paralleling life all the time. And in life, just like in elk hunting, the way to controlling any situation is by having some sort of contingent plan. And, and, that, and that contingent plan can be all kinds of things. It could be a physical way that we act. It could be a mental way that we, that we act. It could be a plan, a strategy. You know, you, you hear all of that stuff. Having alternative strategies, being diverse and adaptable by having options. You follow me? Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, we said this a thousand times, you know, if you got goals, but you don't have a plan, you really got to wish. You know, right. so you got to have these contingency plans to help you get in and out of situation. Well, you think about so many people, how do they learn uh, and what do they learn about elk hunting, especially in September? I mean, they watch videos and it's like, okay, get up on top of the ridge. You scream a bugle, a bull answers, you go down, you call, he comes running in and you shoot him at 20 yards. And, and then it's, uh, you know, grip and grit, right? Yeah. right? I mean, yeah. That that's how it goes. Watch all. No that. way. <laughs> it goes nothing hadn't for me. like that. Hadn't, <laughs> hadn't for me. Maybe some guys can roll up and roll out like that, but not this John. Wayne. No, I, I, and I'm going to tell you. I I think that does happen. It and that's great when that does happen. Yeah. And but if that not is the norm. Yeah. If, if that's the only strategy you have. What's going to happen, or if it's a different time of year, and so things aren't happening that way, or weather turns on you, or um, you're in the drought. I mean, take a look at right now. Take a look at Idaho up there. Take a look at Washington, mm -hmm. and um, hey, oh man, these guys are going through incredible heat waves. It's 120 degrees today, or 118 degrees today in Canada. Unbelievable! And get this: yeah. here in Cimarron, it has yeah. been raining for how many days straight? God, about five days and, yeah, more. and it rains all, all all night long too it's pretty cool yeah, wow. yeah, it, i i think i think something happened in seattle moved to new mexico their bellies up there buddy yeah so tonight oh, what dude. we're going to be talking about is the different ways to deal mitigate to take and turn positive those things that most often are thought about as being out of your control during a hunt. And what I want people to realize is if you have options, they are not really out of your control. It might be something that is occurring. It might be an event, but just because it's an event doesn't mean that it's out of your control. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, any parent should know this. Try raising a teenager. You know, it's like, yes, sir. <laughs> right. What is yeah, that? They don't come with a manual. <laughs> no, 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 there's no, man. there's no manual with them. So, I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, you gotta, 
you know, take your best upbringing and, and try to do what you think's right and make some plans and, and try to get them headed in the right direction. And, you know, my grandpa always said, if you keep them in the woods or on the lake, you won't be looking for them when they get older. So, yeah. I mean, but that's, that's a, true. That's a plan, right? That's a plan. And, and you know, man, I, I you know, people, I say people, Manano gives me a lot of crap because I'm always like, oh, yeah, you're always planning. What do you always have to have a plan? And why are you, you know, and, it, and it's like my profession requires me too. And, uh, and when we go out and drill holes and people's lives are, you know, at stake, you know, if you, if you don't, if you don't have your, your processes and your plans in place, uh, you, can, you can end up hurting people. Right. So it, <clears throat> you can always wish, you can always come up with one plan to drill a well yeah. and then, you know, hope that everything goes as per plan and, you know, everything is fine and dandy and you're wishing and hoping that everything stays within the boundaries that you design your plan for. But man, you know, the reality is that it just, the nine times out of 10, there's always going to be a deviation from that. Yeah. And if you don't yeah. have, God put you the rock have, here, <laughs> you have to, you have to go through a risk assessment and understand what are the potential issues that you can run into and then have contingency plans for those things? Absolutely. Because not only does that give you a peace of mind that, hey, we've, we've thought about this. If you run into that situation, then you know how to react. You're saving people, you're saving time, and you're saving money. And so it, I, don't, I just don't see it differently when we, you know, and you're, you're comparing elk hunting with real life, and this is the perfect yeah. example, right? Yeah. I mean, elk hunting is probably the same. You, you feel psychologically you're in a much better state when you know that you're going to be facing a potential situation, but you know what to do if that happens. Mm -hmm. When we come, when we run into fear is when we actually run into a situation that we don't know how to react. Yeah. And then at that point, you're losing time. You're losing, you know, you, you can put yourself in a dangerous situation out there hunting as well if you don't know how to react to certain things. So, uh, you can put again, I mean, that I, place mentally as well. Really exactly. bad. I mean, we have, we've all said this a thousand times. Pressure is what you feel when you don't know what you're doing. You know, and exactly. if, you, if you've never been in that situation, you hadn't had to train for it or anything else, then you don't know what you're doing. So that makes things a whole lot more dangerous, you know. Yeah. You know, uh, and I'll give you an example of one of these things that are unexpected. And what I'm going to do is, in order to do this, to portray this and teach and give a nugget out there at the same time, I'm going to take uh, an Elk Bros mailbox question that I got from Brian Masters out of Texas. And he asked a question about hunting with, with three guys. And his questions that he used, and, and trust me, I'm going to get there to where this ties into controlling the uncontrollable, okay? Right, right. All right, right. right. So, so his question was, I ha I ha the question I have is hunting with a team of three. Is it more productive to hunt with two shooters, one caller, or two callers, one shooter? Listening around, some say two shooter leads to conflicts and increased risk of failure, and two caller benefits scenarios others say two shooters increase opportunity what are your thoughts all right so what what i want to do is i'm actually going to and for you guys that um that are listening to this you'll get a chance and i'm i'm not sure what the time is on this i'm going to try to find it and put it on youtube for you but what i'm going to do is i'm going to actually share my screen and um i'm going to show i'm going to show uh a diagram here and and talk about this exact situation and i'm gonna let you guys throw in what you guys think about that because we've done it like for example i want you to can you guys see this oh yeah yeah, yeah. real yeah. Good. You good okay oh. yes. so what i have here as you can see i actually have three guys here on it and i have an elk in red so these are guys in green now this situation assumes that all three guys are hunting just like when you me and manana go out Luis, all three right. guys have a boat right right 
Okay. So one of the things, because which one's, which one's Manano? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he's not here. The guy on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so what he's asking is, should there be one guy back with two up front? Or should that be the other way? Now, we actually um, have terms for this. Like this yeah. here, when we this do something like either. this, is just inverted an inverted V. Yeah, yeah. inverted V right here. Yeah, okay. Whereas v. we have our what we call our flying V. Flying, flying v. v. Like this, right? That's okay. cash money right there. So now, but but there's some things that I, I want to talk about with this is that what this elk does is this guy is the variable. His job is to survive and live, right? If I have, and one of the reasons that we do the flying V, and this is what Brian is asking, is a lot of times this elk will come in like this, and it's like, should I shoot? Should I shoot? Should I shoot? And nobody shoots, and we end up in a situation where that elk gets where he wins and he turns and he rolls out of there, okay? Or... Which, it ends up in a situation where that we, over. Go ahead. We had we had that happen mm -hmm. a little bit. You know, it. You know, there was a shot, but we we had that happen mm -hmm. with but, uh, you know, it, you know, Manano and Trey, I believe. Yeah, but did we take the shot? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we have a rule in our camp. And what happens is, is it's just like basketball players. I say, you know, I used to have a problem with kids on my team that instead of taking their shot uh, for a 12 foot jumper, they would kick the ball out or pass the ball off mm -hmm. um, uh, for a lower percentage shot because yeah. they didn't want to be selfish, right? Mm -hmm. So what we've always said is we're a team. Mm -hmm. Our job is to put that animal on the ground as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. So if this person on the left has the clear shot, and they have a shot that's not marginal, and that's the shot they're going to put the animal down, they take the shot. They don't think about the fact that that bull is going closer to the other person. Yeah, you no. have to take that shot because that bull can then change his mind. It happens. He hits these trees right here, yeah. and he doesn't like the way that looks, so now he circles <laughs> around. And, the, and, he and then another, another point, Joe, is that, you know, sometimes even though that animal may be closer to the shooter on the right, like in that case, that that the shooter may not have a a, clean a clear shot. shot. Yeah. Or so the animal may not be standing close. in the right position. Correct. So uh, that might be, even though it's a little further away from the guy on the left, in that yeah. case, that guy on the left may shot. have a very clean, clear um, channel to shoot through. We had so. that same thing happen this year, Joe. And, and, and look, I mean, these things are the things that y'all have to talk about before y'all hit the field. I, I was, we were hunting this year with me and Brendan and Brendan has not taken a bull with his bow. So, um, no doubt I was there, uh, and was, could have killed this bull two or three times, but I'm, I'm acquiescing to Brendan on my left-hand side and the bull's coming straight at it. I mean, and then turns broadside, and I'm like at about 35 yards. But Brendan kind of got caught with his pants down and uh, was looking through his rangefinder instead of drawing his bow. And look, man, I mean, these are things that you know we talk about, we laugh about it now, but it's a serious situation. And I'm waiting on him to shoot this bull dead, and I can't see Brendan because he's behind a tree uh, to the left of me. I can't see. All I can actually see is like the tip of his arrow. And I'm going, man, any minute, this bull's fixing to die. I mean, he's 35, 38 yards. He's dead. You know, I'm like waiting, waiting, waiting. And then sure enough, man, he gets a little gust from the gods and he peels out right in front of me. And when he peels out, I'm already at full draw. This bull is, I mean, he's dead bull walking until I can't see through my peep. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. these are, these are two scenarios that, we learned this year that you, you know, you got to get better at, you got to have a plan. So for and, me, it was about going back to camp and shooting through without a peak, right. And figuring absolutely. it out. But, and, um, and you can't like, when we talk about uncontrollable things, this animal is going to do what he's going to do. Yeah, man. So we're not going to control his thinking, but mm -hmm. we can be prepared for the situation to mm -hmm. understand the situation. So it's not out of our control. You yeah, follow and when he boogered, all I did was cow call, and that stopped him dead in his tracks, broadside 36 yards. I mean, 
like I said, it was slam dunk for me. But but for me, had I took the initiative first, I'd have shot him at 42 yards broadside and never would have thought about Brendan having the shot, you know, because he stopped at 42 yards broadside. I could have smoked him. And I'm waiting on Brendan. So, but we, we knew that going forward, Brendan would be up first and we were going to do our best job, me and Joe, to get that guy a bull. And we had plenty of days left. I mean, it was no big deal. And I wanted Brendan to have that opportunity. So right. um, those now, are things that you got to discuss. Uh, you know, uh, Brian, you got to discuss that with the guys that you're hunting with. And uh, for me, if, if I could interject there and say what I prefer, I prefer having two hunters and one caller, especially if the guy's, is, you know, really good caller because he's going to be able to drag that bull through y'all nine times out of 10. And yeah. if it doesn't work out, guess who's going to kill the bull? The caller is going to. And, and that's what I was, I was curious, Joe, um, and your perspective on the other situation and, and your thoughts on that. Cause I'm sure you can make it work that way too. But I mean, honestly, we've found this way to be just because of, the communication between the three of us and your ability to pull elk and steer them depending on on the direction because obviously you're looking at wind you're looking at where the elk is coming from right. where your huntings are where your hunters are and then your movement and your position to bring it through one hunter or the other depending on where the bull is going but and obviously it's easier to control with a flying v the way you're showing it but i'm just curious as to your thoughts on the other position and, right? and i'm gonna i'm gonna cover that right here in a second but I, I what i want to make sure is is that in this situation that we're in right now you guys are not most of the time you don't have calling now and we have roles when we have a caller mm -hmm. back that's that caller's job their yeah, job does. is to shoot their job is not to call up there right but what you if you are truly a team and you've talked about this like gilbert said where you have a contingency plan mm -hmm. and let's say that this bull right here and and what i like about this is this allows me to do a lot of things right yeah but if this bull is circling and he's starting to circle like this to get down Wait, i can yeah. actually i can come over here and right. i can start pulling that bull so that he turns and he comes exactly. in that direction i can keep dropping 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 to get that bull to turn in fact that's exactly what happened with me and chav on the story that you guys listened to on burn me twice chav is actually in a position with a bull that we're something like this I'm actually, and what happened was, well, and I'll show you exactly how we started out so that you guys can see what I'm talking about. Chav is set up like this. He has bulls that are off in a distance like so, okay? And I'm just going to throw this over here because I don't want you to pay any attention to him. This is me right here, and I'm back here from Chav, and we have a bull over in this area. And as I hear that bull, because I can see Chav here, I had a drop off in, in, in land back here, in terrain, in topography. So what I did was I backed off so there's no way the bull could see what was talking. He couldn't see a cow, couldn't see a bull, right? So as I drop off, what I start to hear, and we have this wind. This wind is actually going um, north south yeah so if, if we said the top of this was north, north and the bottom mm -hmm. is south it was going south to north okay okay that's how that wind it was going south to north it was crossing and we we hunt a lot in a crosswind well what started to happen was that bull started and i could tell that he started to circle to this mm. side right here just like this so what was getting ready to happen when when it He's getting ready to catch that wind. So you have to move to the to the west there, and that absolutely. So actually, what happens is what I call a turntable effect. As an animal starts to circle, I am on the other side of the record turntable, circling myself, and I'm back far enough doing it in the brush so that that animal's not able to see me, and I'm not able to see that animal. I know where Chab is because of my internal compass of where I left him last, right? Mm -hmm. So I start moving off to the side like this, and this bull continues to come, and right about there when he does, I continue up, and I'm on a ridge just like this. That bull is right here on Chav, and 
he, he's starting to come. I can tell that he's in Chav's vicinity. I'm not able to see him, but I can tell by his movement. And I'm thinking Chav's going to have a shot any time. I start raking a tree right here. He runs it. What does he do, Chav? He runs. <laughs> he runs right past, right past me. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just like this. Because, and, and here's one thing, and, and I'll tell you. Um, one thing that I say in the story as well is Chab does not call and he didn't have a diaphragm and Chab did not think to grunt at that bull as he was coming to stop him. Okay. So that again is one way to control the uncontrollable. He had no control over this bull deciding to come on a beeline to me, but he could have controlled that had he, you know, just done that or thrown out a grunt with the diaphragm. <coughs> All right. And that, that would also depend, Chaff, did you see him as he was the clo at the closest point to you, or did you see him just when he was already past you? No, I saw, uh, it, it was actually in a burn area, so I saw oh, okay. him the whole time. The whole time? Yeah. But, but a couple of other bulls had already circled around me, so I had positioned myself, I was in the wrong position, kneeling down. <laughs> So I had to turn all the way around to get a shot at that bull anyway. But he oh, came yeah. it came running by, so I didn't have the chance. And, so I'm, and I'm wide open, you know. Mm. Yeah. And, and the bull just keeps going right by him. The bull ends up coming up, and I see him down there 80 yards from me. And I'm getting ready to start raking a tree. I got a bow down at my feet right now. And I think this bull is going to come up. And so I, what I do is I have to pick up my bow. I have to get around and, the tree that I'm And, and quiet down. Yeah, and, and <laughs> in the position uh, to be able to get a shot. And I think this guy is going to come, you know, broadside up just like this and get a shot. No, I'm not able to control what he does. He actually turns and starts coming straight up with a frontal. But where I got lucky was right about 20 yards. He turns and he starts coming across broadside just like this. And at uh, 18 yards, I bury him at 18 yards, right? So wow. that, that's just to give you an example of, how you can still control, even though I couldn't control this animal is going to do what he was going to do, but yeah. I could do a contingency plan and understand since he's doing that, if I do this, I can then, uh, I can start to move his mindset. I can control his movement. All right. So going back to what you were talking about, Luis, going mm. just the opposite where we have right. two callers and one shooter up front yeah I, I mean i would think that you're just op your options narrow down a little bit because actually, actually yes and no because okay. if if your if your goal is to get this animal um to make sure that this guy has a shot and okay. all and let's say that all three guys can call and the, and look and this is what i'm telling you um if you're not able to call uh, and you're with and you're with a group you are a weak link, okay? To be able to call is going to be something that can help a situation. Uh, if you're not able to, then we have to be in this situation. You got to have somebody that's basically going to designate themselves to be a caller in that situation. Yeah, and I think it also has to do, Joe, with like in our case, um, the setup will depend on who's tagged out or not too, sure, right? Absolutely. Because, yeah. because if, if, if two guys are not tagged out, then right. yeah, the flying V for sure. But if, if there's only one guy left, then absolutely a situation like this, well, you know, may be the right thing to do. The other one that we've done besides the V though, is when we do the L, uh -huh. you know, we'll have one guy that'll go straight out in front and one guy that'll go to the downwind side. And that's a that's also a good setup on there because what happens is with well, that means that we got the downwind coming this way. So and if that bull's anywhere over here, he's gonna get that a shot opportunity. If I think he's rolling too much, then I can throw my calls or I can rotate back and try to bring him through this group right here. Okay, so that somebody's gonna give the shot. Again, I'm gonna make the moves as the caller back there. And and so that's another alternative. And that way if he tries to circle and he tries to go to that downwind side, that's gonna give this guy the optimum shot on that side. So mm -hmm. that's what we call the inverted L there or a post route. I mean, you're yeah. gonna hear me in football talk about all yeah. kinds of things, <laughs> okay? Yeah. So you got that post route that you do right there so that you can actually do that. That's one out front because a lot of times they will come direct, um, but 
you know, this can end up being a frontal. Hopefully it doesn't end up being in that situation if you place just right with your shooting lanes. If you make sure your shooting lane is real thick and you have your shooting lane through here. Yeah, I think I think the key, Joe, there is a setup to understand that the collar in the back has to be dynamic in Absolutely. its position in, in their position, right? Yep. Sometimes. Yeah. For and sure. sometimes uh, the shooters uh, have to be dynamic too. One hundred percent. Got to get, got to get yourself in the position to make the kill. You know, to make the clean shot. So, um, it, it, one of the, another thing, Joe, is you know, we complicate that matter even more because a lot of times we'll have a, a cameraman with us. So, sure. I mean, Absolutely. we got him over the shooter's shoulder or one or the other shooter's shoulder uh, a lot of times. So we got four guys sometimes, five guys in a set, yep. right? So, I mean. It, it can get it can get pretty hairy real quick too but yeah I mean when we kill my bull this year we dive off of a ridge I mean literally running down the ridge to get to where these bulls are and then we fan out Brendan goes to the left I go to the right and Joe's like go down there and kill that bull right right now I'm gonna be here I'm gonna call him straight up the, the hill to you be ready and Man, before I know it, we blow one up before we even get down to the ridge, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you got to be – the shooters have got to be dynamic for sure, you know. Yeah. Joe, yeah. Uh, could you back up just a second? You said something that's real important um, about the guys, you know, talking about uh, being a caller. Mm -hmm. What does a caller look like in your eyes versus maybe somebody that just can make some elk noises – so to, to me, um, in a situation like this, especially, uh, once they start getting in tight um, and it's something that could be a visual thing, I would just need somebody that could give decent cow calls, pants, grunts, glunks. It doesn't even have to be difficult, dude. You know, yep. because at this point in time like this, you're not wanting to scream this dude out where he thinks that you're right on top of him right there. Right. You just want to give that illusion Coaching of that – right that bull with that cow so i'm looking for people that can that can give cow calls recognize the situation um and easily do some glunks on on there and that's going i guarantee you you're going to get a bull to come check that out yeah some oh. raking yeah stuff like yeah. that absolutely simple easy stuff it doesn't stuff. it doesn't take being a world champion caller no. to be able to convince that bull that there's a scenario uh, going on i agree bring him right yeah, you don't have to be at the level of coal by any means <laughs> whatever <laughs> <It's a little laughs> Look, I, you know a couple of years ago when i killed my bull and we had brendan in the flying v and we actually were giving up on this bull he actually sounded off a couple times and it was just by happenstance that I said, Joe, don't give up on this guy yet. I think I hear him glunking down there. Can you can you hit him one more time? And Joe hit him with a lost cow call, and he was probably still a quarter mile from us. And uh, he hit him with that lost cow call, and I'm telling you, Katie bar the door, son. He, mm -hmm. he erupted, and not only did he call him up a ridge, he called him across a barrier. OK, uh, it was one of the most unbelievable scenes of patience. And then not only when, once we got him in the kill zone, we we had about a four and a half, five minute standoff with him at about 35 yards eight, frontal. Eight, and eight and minutes, do, yeah, do what, Bubba? Eight minutes. It was eight minutes. That he eight, eight. OK, eight. Wow, minutes. Oh, myself short. It was eight minutes of stare down <laughs> and him looking at Brendan, him looking at Joe, him looking at me. You know, and I, I'm I, I'm not full drawn uh, that time, but had gotten full drawn and had to wait. And then the bull decides to turn, and I got to step out and move to even get the shot right. And we put him down within 15 seconds. But man, it was I'm telling you, it's the most unbelievable calling scenario to watch we were giving up we were bailing out of there because it was getting later and stuff like that and it was getting dark and we were going to bail out of the whole thing and uh, i just i i just I heard that bull down and what he was doing he was in a wallow and we didn't know he was in the wallow till he come out of it and just was black as the ace of spades <laughs> man i mean he was all black and uh but again you know we're in the flying v and joe absolutely stays 
put. He doesn't leave me. He's on my six the whole time. And I just got lucky and the bull turned the right way to come up the hill towards me and not towards Brendan. If yeah. he comes toward, I mean, Brendan's probably 60 yards from him. The other side. And I mean, he keeps rolling. Brendan's probably going to get the shot. Yeah. But now, at that time, it was whoever got it, got it. And, and Cole, something that, to go back to your question, though, is the other variables are it depends on what caused that bull to come in in the first place. Like mm-hmm. if I brought that bull because he was responding to bull sounds, if he was responding to challenge bugles, mm-hmm. then I might need somebody that needs to change up that can throw out a challenge bugle. But let me tell you this, if you can do a basic location mm-hmm. bugle, then you can do a challenge bugle. I promise yeah. anybody Absolutely. can do that. Yeah, It's just so, a bit, it's, it's like just the intensity yeah. intensity it's, it's just right. air volume and <laughs> and inflection of voice that's all it's like it is hello now. and hello yeah. I mean, it's just you just yeah get that up but here's what i want to where i want to take this grinders tuning in thank you for listening to the blue collar elk hunting podcast our goal is to share our knowledge and help you flatten that learning curve so that you too can have some of the very same incredible experiences that have given all of us here at Elk Bros a lifetime of memories. If you like what you hear or see, you can get all of this information plus so much more from our Base Camp Elk Hunting Training Camp, the first in a series of online courses from our Blue Collar Elk Academy. Our Base Camp Training Camp allows me to use my coaching style and share almost 40 years of elk hunting experiences successfully hunting elk on public lands as well as over 20 years guiding hunters of all ages and experience levels. This course will be like nothing you have ever experienced in concept and structure using success-based coaching techniques that will elevate your confidence and skill sets. Our camp will prepare you specifically from that final moment most in your control, those final minutes or seconds the elk is in front of you, backwards through each step and level, allowing you to see, visualize, understand, and relate every coaching point to what lies ahead, the next step, the next thought process, the next success. Because y'all, you've already been there. You know what it looks like. By tapping my 30 years of teaching and coaching experience, our camps are developed considering multiple learning modes with text, visuals, audio, as well as video. And Base Camp will benefit those new to elk hunting all the way to the 10 to 15 year vet. So if you are looking for that one thing to help you fill that tag this year, invest in the most important piece of equipment there is, you and your elk hunting knowledge. You can find the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Academy and the Base Camp Training Camp at elkbros.com. That's E-L-K-B-R-O-S dot com. Keep dreaming of the screaming, believing in achieving, and most of all, keep grinding. And, and what I want you guys to think about this and what I do like about the, the arrow formation like this is that let's say that we do have the wind again at a crosswind. So Mm -hmm. the way we're facing that it's coming from our left to our right, and this bull is coming in, but what has happened is we have two callers back in the back that's making it sound like, and they could even be closer possibly just so that everybody can see everybody. So we're probably at 40 yards, something like that, maybe 50 yards, just as long as we're in visible sync, right? Invisible sync. Well, what happens is, is, is if this bull starts to come across and starts to go to this wind like here, does this guy want to call? No, no he no, shuts no, up, man. He, he, he shuts, shuts up, up man. He quiet, shuts man. up. And now this guy is the only one that's going to call. And the reason he's going to do that is so that now he gets that bull to turn and hopefully we get that shot right there before he hits his wind. Right. Okay. Yep. Now here's the other thing on that. So what happens with this is if this bull decides, and again, we're not able to control, he is the uncontrollable factor. All we can control is what we know as far as our op. And if this bull now starts to come across this way and he's calling from right here, should these guys call? Nope. 
No. Oh, oh man. By oh, hearing man. that bull come around towards that left right there, now we go from two callers to a single caller yeah. trying to pull right through these two guys right here. Yeah. Now we have yeah. shooters in position, right? You'll so, hang you'll hang him up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because he's wanting to see an elk. Yeah, that's he's right. He's wanting to see an elk. And if that bull rolls like this, this guy should know now I am primary caller yeah, because of how we're set it. up, and I can even drop back drop. and go away, exactly. man. Now I start exactly. doing that insistent cow call going away. I do a roundup, you go and some plunks yeah. as I'm going like that. He's and coming. I am yeah. telling you, you're going to change this. So, mm. what I'm trying to tell you is if you guys understand what to do according to wind and where that animal is and what that means because now you become front proximity right here now you become fr front proximity so what happens right now if that bull continues just like this and this guy's coming back and he's calling and he ends up coming to this i'm sorry he can comes up to this situation now we're on a single shooter two caller situation man yeah because now this guy recognizes, well, that bull's past him. I can now try to bring him into me. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, a, a team of three is just uh, so versatile. It, it is. is. Um, Especially when all three guys can call. Yeah. 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 So, and knowing when, knowing when to be quiet and rotate like that record, like mm -hmm. Joe was saying. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it's so just, I, and that's where the challenge, the challenge comes. Uh, and I think it's just um, having the visual. Mm -hmm. with the yeah. other hunters and the animal and then right. to the communication right of, because you know the stuff that one hunter is seeing the other may not be yeah. seeing Absolutely. And, and just be able being able to communicate there it's it's tough so again we've talked about these in some of the other podcasts this hand signals and all that stuff right. and at least having that visual to the other hunter because there have been situations that we have been in joe that your ability to see the hunter Mm -hmm. And to see the hunter's behavior has made you do the right thing and make the right decisions in order to change the outcome of the situation to a Absolutely, positive one. Man. Because yeah. if, if this bull is going to the right, this hunter, if he just, uh, if he just takes and, and where he's at, if he just holds up his right arm to say he's going to my right. Yeah. So that, and they recognize that signal that tells them immediately when they see that and he's like, Oh, he's coming to the right, right here. I got to shut up, man. Now I'm getting ready to become, depending on what happens with the wind and the situation. What if the wind now switches like this and that bull's yeah. rolling around, he definitely wants to shut up right there. Right. And now this yep. guy becomes a crawler in the back. So everybody has to read. You've got to be able to read and hand signals. Y'all are, are really important. Being yeah, able yeah. To, to, to give to signals each that other. aren't mm -hmm. going to be flashy and that you understand what each other are saying, what you need to do. Because there might even be the situation right here where this bull's out like this, and he's out to this side, which this hunter sees that he's reacting like Chap saw him react to the rake, and he's able to give a signal to this guy to rake, or he's reacting to a cow call, and he can give a signal for a cow call that he sees what he's reacting to to help yeah. himself out in that situation. So hand signals, being able to call, understanding proximity to each other and what the and who should be the caller in that situation if that mm. bull is out front here this guy's never calling yeah. he's never calling the only time that that guy calls is if you're doing something where it's kind of like a power eye situation that happens with mm. two hunters and we'll talk about that in another situation and that's something that i'm putting on the on the the elk academy as well but there's different things you can do with two different things with three but what i want you to see here is in answering this question i'm showing you how this guy and even though his mindset is uncontrollable we can still have some control over the situation okay you bet. so and, and and for me joe i like to have two callers with me i'm, I'm just and here and hear me out real quick mm -hmm. it was one really awesome September evening. And I had the distinct pleasure of having Joe Gillia and the legend himself, RC Knox calling for me. Okay? Uh, no doubt two of the finest elk callers in the country. And these two cats were 
lighting the woods up. And what do I mean by that? They had a scenario going on that these elk were not really just coming to calls all the time, but they blew a scenario up below a herd of elk that were up on a ridge. And when they blew that scenario up and, and had, it sound like two herds colliding down there. It was the coolest thing I've ever seen. And Joe finally had to, to bail out because they just were not coming. Well, all of a sudden RC did something that got an attention from one of these bulls. And I'm telling you all hell broke loose and bulls started coming out of everywhere. And RC left me like, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I turn around and look and I'm like, Oh my God, I'm all by myself, but I can hear RC. I, I'm, and y'all got to understand now I am super young. First year ever elk hunting in my life. Right. I turn around and I look and they, they RC is gone. He's going the other direction. And I'm going, man, what in the world is going on? Why is he leaving me? You know, well, what he was doing the whole time, I had no clue. He was pulling that bull towards me off the top of that ridge. And brother, when I tell you, he pulled him to me, he set him in my lap at 19 yards, man. And, uh, and I put an arrow in the bull and from there on fellas, I'm going to tell you what, it was crazy we must have had 10 bulls come down off that ridge and getting fights in front of us try to run us over and yeah. do all other th kinds of things to us that i can't talk about on this podcast but <laughs> it was going on son let me tell you so anytime i can get two callers that are that are like that in my set shoot dog i'm gonna shut up and watch the fireworks because uh get me you know hold, somebody hold my beer or whatever because i'm telling you it's going to be fun you know especially when the animals are around and you guys are hearing them uh yeah. these guys are you know i'm just blessed to be able to hunt with some of the best elk collars in the world and i've gotten to learn from these guys and you know and it works i'm gonna tell you right now i've, I've caught, had some real delicate situations where i've had to make a few calls myself and it's been really cool uh, to get and, and have the opportunity to hunt with two callers or two hunters. And either way, I mean, you know, it, I think it's the best scenario per person. So, yeah. And that, go ahead, Luis. No, I was just going to say at adding to that, you know, absolutely. I mean that we've been practicing the three man crew for our hunt, you know, and it's been, it's interesting because as versatile as the setup is, we have to been we have been adaptive to that as well to when when one is filming one is calling one is shooting and then switching roles and then in the middle of a set one shoots another one goes back and calls while the other one goes back to the front and tries to shoot and so but it's been a work in progress because yeah. obviously you know, especially Manano and I have been growing, learning these techniques and, and, and understanding the logic behind all of it. But at the same time, I just wanted to make clear that, yes, it does sound perfect. And mm. the immediate reaction will be is like, yeah, man, let's, the three of us, let's go out there and go elk hunting. <laughs> and, and really, it's not that easy because <laughs> the room for messing up is, is you know, wide. You oh, know, you, there, there's there's three people involved. The scent is bigger. Um, the, if the lack of communication is there, the the recipe for catastrophe is is more <laughs> is is more evident, I guess. So it, it's important to understand that there are also things that you know come with three, you know, two or three people in a set that make it also difficult i guess and that's why communication um key. and and teamwork i mean Managing it's just like anything man you take a football team that doesn't have a playbook and put them on a field what what's it going to look like better have a good quarterback yeah so you know <laughs> but if he ain't got nobody that knows how to run a route he's screwed right exactly. so he's going to end up on his back on a, a lot so yeah. it's real important that you guys communicate and have a contingency plan and talk about that. And don't just make, you know, I, I'll tell you, as a guide, I've been in situations where I've had guys that were on a hunt and we end up with an animal that comes out where my hunter has to get in shooting position. The first time it happens, my it, it's very awkward. And my hunter takes their time to get in shooting position and gets in shooting position too late. 
So what happens is, is the next time that I do it, I tell them a little bit ahead of time that, man, you got to get ready to get over here. It's still a little bit slow. Well, the third time I'm like, okay, we got to have a conversation way ahead before right. it happens. <laughs> and then the third time everything flows because we had the conversation. We said, yeah. when this happens, you're going to do A, B, and C. Instead of we had done that in the first one, one hundred percent, Joe. But the other thing that is, I think, is extremely important is own it, man. Yeah. If and then and then try to just to kind of evaluate the situation and understand where you messed up, and uh, and then just own it, and then it makes things a lot better. Because if somebody's pointing out something to you that hey, maybe you should have done this differently and stuff like that, don't take just grow a thick skin, man, and don't take it personal. That person is trying to teach you something. Just own it, take it, and be like, you know what, man, you're right. I need to work on that for the next time and own it for the next time. It just it just makes that um relationship and that 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 teamwork between the three way better and and that's the only way to progress and advance and getting you know and communicating better in every set so do you think luis for example and i'll, I'll give everybody uh, i love that man right there and i think how he has Likewise, grown brother. as a hunter is tremendous man so mutual man um but we're we're in a situation and he's back there and he's chuckling and when he comes back we're still in the hunt and i'm go luis next time don't chuckle right? <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed just the same way I just laughed now. <laughs> and he knows yeah. that comes out of me is the God's on the truth. I'm not going to tell him, okay, man, you know, and, 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 and you're also at the, at the same time, him and I have been in a situation where we've had an animal coming. I said, Luis call. And he's like, what? Call, you know, get that animal to react and, and put trust and faith in him to be able to do what he needs to do and, and understand that, you know, it's okay to mess up, man. It's okay to try. It's, you know, it's not critical. But when at that time, what I was basically telling him is of all the stuff you're doing good, that's one thing you're not doing well that needs work. Right. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. And look, man, guess what I was doing the other day, driving to work. You know, Chuckling. I had, I had a recorded video from Joe, from the, academy on my phone playing over and over and i was trying to imitate the chuckle in my vehicle so you had people you know don't do this at home <laughs> at don't do weird. this at home but you had people in the in the highway looking at me like what is that dude doing yeah yeah <laughs> so, but yeah i mean to the point is like yeah you got to understand your weakness weaknesses and we've talked about these also in previous podcasts and just work on those you know it's just like there are things that you get better at and then, you know, you kind of overcome that, those, those difficulties, but then, okay, what's the next weakness that I need to work on and then just keep on working on. So I want, I want to take this to the next step, man. And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because a lot of the stuff we talk about and each one of these are kind of their own podcasts and we've hit them on a lot of podcasts. But when people talk about uncontrollable events, guys, what are some of the things that happen out there in the woods or in conditions or in other ways that we're not able to control that changes our hunting situation? Weather. Weather, right? I mean, we had snow. You can have rain, wind. A lot of people are like, well, I'm not going to hunt in the wind because I can't hear nothing. Where really, man, you go hunt in the wind, you get, that is perfect. Yeah, I know, perfect. I know. I like it because the animals can't hear you. No. I've seen some of the biggest bulls I've ever seen in my life in a 50 mile an hour gale wind. And we ended up killing a bull at 134 yards with a muzzle loader. But I'm telling you, most guys would have said, I ain't going out there. It's way too daggum windy. And yeah. uh, I guarantee you, when you hear a bull, <laughs> and it's a 30 40 mile hour gale like that he's on top of you fella. i feel yeah. more stealthy with the with the oh, higher yeah, wind man. Man. can make you, all kinds already of racket taken away three of the animal senses man senses. because yeah. they're seeing everything moving they're not able to smell as long as you keep the wind right they're not able to hear anything 
in fact, you know, it, it's not a great situation for that animal, man, at and all. And most of the They're time when it's weird. windy like that, it's it's generally in kind of the same direction. You don't get those slow, whirly sure. winds and stuff mm -hmm. like that. It's generally in the same direction. So yeah. it doesn't, it's not changing on you so often. And, and we're not talking about bend the trees over wind. We're talking about wind where it's hard to hear. It's going yeah. through the trees and stuff like that. What's yeah. another thing that would be an uncontrollable? Man, wind? people always complain about this one, but I really don't think it's a hint since moon phase yeah like i'm i'm going where the moon's bright or not fellas you know the moon's been here for all our lives you know if it's up or if it's down we're gonna get after it you yeah and, and i i so love I it bother me. Myself, man. so yeah. i mean it's just because you have to change your tactic and and i can tell you this is most people complain about the moon phase because elk leave out of the parks sooner to go to bed right get well, up earlier if you're a bow hunter now for a rifle hunter that's a difficult situation sure for a bow hunter sure. you're not going to kill him in that park anyway mm. you're going to want that booger yeah. in the trees so you know you start hunting those travel corridors instead of those parks and you're going to be in a whole lot better situation start and out above them early absolutely man so when and, and so i'm able even though i'm not able to control the moon it's going to happen but I can have a plan. I can have an option of a way to deal with that, whether it's snow, whether it's fog, whether it's hot or it's dry. I mean, if it is, if it's hot and dry, man, I, I know that these animals have to water, right? Now, let me tell you something about that. You've been hunting the Gila, Eric, all these years. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Perfect area where um, it gets hot and dry and everybody thinks that they can sit on a water hole and kill an animal. Does it happen? Negative. Oh, Negative. Man, they'll go miles Negative. and miles. They'll go what? miles. Yeah. Matter of fact, they'll, they'll crowd holes. They leave their sand everywhere, and they're fighting over water holes, sitting there all day. They all can't come into that water. They're going to find another place to water down. And they're going to come when you're not there in the middle of the night. But in the not middle coming. of the night. So right. what, what I tell people is when you find water holes that elk are hitting, try to find from those water holes Lord that Lord. two mile – to two and a half mile area from those water holes because yeah. that's where those critters are going to Stage. be and then they're going to go water at night and then they're going to go back to those other areas so you know it, because it's hot and dry look i have in 30 there's going to be 39 years chad this year is it 39 this year now since you turned yeah. 30. maybe 40 <laughs> in in all of my years of all the elk i've killed i've never killed one over water never and and it's not like I haven't sat it, right? RC, have have, have you killed one over water, RC? You lucky son of a buck. Me too. Yeah, I had a bull come in at uh, eight steps, and uh, <laughs> with a recurve, and uh, took him out. So it, yeah, it was, I mean that was, that was that was uh, that was a good good scenario and all had it's quite a story a bear came in left his scent and he went right up the trail where the elk came in so the elk couldn't smell me where i had gone through that trail so so the bear smelled worse than you did oh yes most definitely <laughs> yes. Well, so so get this rc at the time was reading a book you know, <laughs> yeah. yes, yes, I was. And uh, RC, tell these boys what that bull scored, man. Ah, uh, he scores 373 <laughs> before deductions. Before wow. actually, it's 368. Yeah, well, that's a toad. He was a toad, man. Wow. At eight steps. RC's reading a book, awesome. look but most toad. importantly, what was the book about? <laughs> God's promises. That's awesome. Bro. I like it. Hey, look at that, man. That that that's awesome right there. So, so that that's that's something to think about on that is is what the conditions. You're not able to control conditions, but you can have contingency plans. You can work within that. That is the whole thing is I I there are things in life that we are not able to control. We're not able to control that, but we can have options on how we are going to react and act to those actions. How about other hunters? Hmm. Yeah, man. Yeah, we deal with that every don't, year. You don't control that, right? Yep. Can't control it. Yep. Can't You're control it, but don't worry about it. Nope. 
it's gonna wear you out sometimes. You, you You're can set up in a set, and you can make a, a better situation out of that. And a fine example yeah. of that is just would you stole the story uh, story of Eric, right? Absolutely. Um, and then we mm -hmm. also bumped into several hunters mm. as as we've been hunting together. And and if anything, it's been an exchange of information. And you've you know we've made friendships. I've made friends of Heck people yeah. in public land hunting pigs. Heck you yeah. know, with guys that I've met out there, and and now. It's it created a network of guys that communicate and inform each other of you know opportunities. So, the, you, you can make again lemonade out of lemons. Um, yeah. and especially it's on when how it, you want to view the situation, how you want to handle your attitude. And you there, read that you know? pressure too. You read the yeah. other hunters as well, and and, mm -hmm. yeah. and you know what time is it they're getting out there? You know what areas are they truly going to? What time are they going back to camp? When any any time you have um, hunting a lot of hunting pressure, what you want to do is hunt where or when there's not pressure. So you're either out there earlier when people are in camp at midday, you're out there later. So there's so many people that want to be back at their bike or in their vehicle and that last two hours before dark. There's so many people that don't want to roll out of bed and they want to walk out in the daylight. There's so many people that are going to be taking midday naps. There's people that are not going to bugle up elk and put them to bed at night. Um, so, or they're not going to get other than, you know, uh, there's some people that aren't going to get a hundred, 200 yards away from their four wheeler because they're going to ride. So, I mean, it's, it's, you hunt where and when pressure's not. And I think Joe, I, I, part of the message of, of today in my mind is you can, you know, when you really think there is something out there in the hunt that you can't control, really give it a hard think. Is it is it really something I cannot control? Because you would you would realize that if you give it a hard thought and you actually, you know, can can work away, there is always going to be a way to work around it. Um, if, if you really are willing to put the time and the effort to do it. So it's just challenging yourself when you actually find an excuse to see if it's really an excuse that you cannot control or one that you can actually do something about. Yeah. A cop out, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a, a lot of times we do bump, bump into other hunters. We always find success that same day and yeah. not too far away from that uh, situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've been real lucky in that respect. Oh, you know, yes. I, I Just keep back one, one time Chav and I were setting up on a bull and some cows. Uh, they were right in front of us. I mean, literally, we're watching them probably 110 yards from us. And, I mean, we got the bull talking. We got the cows looking at us and fixing to call the cows to us. And here comes <laughs> dude pulls right up on them, and they're all like, God dang, look at all the milk run off. You know? so, Chav and I look at one another, and we're like, Man, dude, I can't believe this happened. <laughs> and uh, that's the day I called that bull in for Chav way up upon a big tall ridge. But from we started way down below that morning and crawled that ridge all the way to the very top. And uh and then it was you know, probably four hours later when we called that 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 it was two herds together. And yep. uh so we were rewarded for not, you know, being upset and cursing yeah. those guys out and everything else yeah was it upsetting well yeah i mean you know you got an opportunity that's blown but you know what's so cool hunting with chav and joe is on to the next opportunity yeah you know? always. always and, always and learning options. go ahead eric no, sorry I'm just saying you always got to just have options you know all these things you you you, you laid out joe like hunting. hunters jumping in your play hunting pressure your weather the wind the snow hot dry moon face i had them all yeah I, you, I've had them all in one hunt, but you know what? Nothing changes is my, my tactics, where I'm going to go look for animals, because they're still going to bed. They're still going to water. They still got to eat. I'm going to be digging they're around. Gonna and I'm gonna they're get, still going to breathe. Yeah. They, they're going to do all those things. You just got to get out and keep hustling and, and trying to find it. And, uh, Never you know, give up. Basement, all that stuff. You just, no, you just go, 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 go. And if it doesn't happen that day, you get up and you you you, you will keep working your plan. Don't ever right. never give up on your plan. You gotta you make adjustments, but you gotta you gotta stay in the fight the whole yeah. time. And, and and just, I want to one of the things. Every one of these, Joe, these uncontrollable events, 
We've dealt with every one of them on just about 95% of every elk hunt we've been on. Yeah. Every one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm looking at them and I'm like, hell, this was just last year. Yeah. <laughs> so we dealt with every one of those. Well, and I was yeah. going to mention when we were talking about the, the other hunters, you know, that time that, uh, you know, and, and I guess you can consider that a, an uncontrollable event, you know, the time that, that Chav wasn't feeling very good at camp. And then we had the issues with the four wheelers and stuff like that. And and then we kind of had a, a meeting at camp and then, you know, we kind of divided and conquer. We were all, you know, kind of down Brendan Manano and I were like, man, we just, we just want to go with you guys. We'll, we'll get this done. And you guys were like, no, mm -hmm. part of your job now is to actually stay at camp and make it happen. And, uh, mm -hmm. it just, you know, again, that was, the whole situation was uncontrollable really in general, but, um, we, we, we made a plan for it. And so again, the three of us, Manano, Brendan and I, the three most unexperienced hunters, <laughs> uh, went out on a hunt on our own. And as we're going through the woods, we find another uncontrollable event, which we start hearing elk. I start calling elk and we start doing the V Manano and Brendan go up in front. I stay in the back. I start calling and we start hearing the elk closer and closer. And it turns out that we just see the hunters. So all did some elk hunters. Yeah. So the, the people calling was actually other hunters. They didn't see us. So at that point, because we saw them, they didn't see us. We're like, you know what? Back We're down. just going to kind of back out. They're in a setup. I don't know if they're seeing something that we're not seeing. Let's just quietly back out, let them be in their setup. As we back out and turn around, we hear elk on the other side. And we're like, well, wait a minute. This might be other hunters or this might be elk, but the rule is you always go and check it out. So we went to check it out. <laughs> we went to check it out. And guess what? That was an elk. And we were able to actually create an opportunity we brought that elk in twice and um you know missed opportunities you know <laughs> shots fired missed shots and so on and so forth it happens to the best of us um Mine i'm not gonna say it was manano that missed twice i'm not gonna say that in the podcast um <laughs> look look I, my, my but, but again it's making creating the opportunities <laughs> mine and child's honey hole was discovered because our truck got and we there you go. right chow yeah i remember that <laughs> we got we got stuck for three days and had to hunt the area walking out that we were stuck at until somebody came to pull us out and found more elk than we knew what to do with that everybody else was going by so you just have to change with the thing what's going on and like you said louise that's the whole message right there is always be willing to be dynamic to have options to think about the uh, outside the box to problem solve and to find a way do not just be that one trick pony all right yeah because so, you're going to deal with every one of these on a hunt yeah. i promise you so let's go to our every one cell box man so that we can uh because we're, we're we're running on some time here so go to the elk rose mailbox chab who's up first okay first up is joe wells from lindale texas and he asked the beetle kill in conifers is about 80 to 85 percent in our area how does this affect the elk? I know they need to, I know they need dark timber for bedding and now there is almost none left. Should we be looking for a new area? What area? Well, okay. So I, I want you to think about this. Anytime you have a burn, go ahead, Luis. Can I, can I time out yeah. real quick? Yeah. Just for the ones that wouldn't know, like me, uh, the beetle kill. Yeah, it's killing pine first. trees. Huh? Beetles kill pine trees boar beetles oh okay 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 so what I, I just i didn't understand the question that's yeah it'll almost pine it'll almost look, yeah it'll almost look like a burn area yeah. all you see yeah. is the, the two pine boar beetles yeah. oh okay so what, i follow so what it, what it does do is it allows the sunlight in to so it's cabin. kind of like a it's kind of like a burn area so yeah. the the grass underneath it is really good. good but they do need to find a place to uh, bed down so okay. Uh, okay. i would look for a corridor I'll say this, Kyle tools. and I, Kyle and I hunt a lot of beetle kill area. Um, it just seems to keep the people out because when that stuff starts to die, it, 
a lot of dead pollen piles up and the elk use that for for cover and protection like you wouldn't believe yeah. and we've actually found bulls we'll be hiking through the middle of just it seems wide open because there's no canopy but there's grass and feed everywhere even browse yeah. um and and it you would be surprised that uh, in some of those areas they still find crazy little pockets to bed down in and it's yeah. just like to me I, I consider that to be as good as a burn almost yeah mm -hmm. absolutely very cool and and, and it's, you got to treat it like a burn. A lot of times you can have some, some other areas that or, or fringes that'll go into it. That's, that's growth or green, or you'll have fringes that will have some thick trees as well. So you have bedding areas and you have feed areas, just like you do with the burn. So you have some of that. And like you said, some of those guys will stay right out in the middle of it. And it kind of depends on, you know, how much it's crashed down because yeah. they are just like we are too, you know, they, might use some of that if they have to if the pressure's too much but they want to reserve energy as much and take the path of least resistance so they're going to go through some of that beetle kill where it's still not everything's not toppled down man on that too so um they'll bed in that toppled down area but they're going to want to feed in those areas where they can still move in and out of so uh, a beetle kill like chad said man when you anytime you open the canopy you have feet and and, have grass. and, and exactly. that beetle kill, if, if it's an early beetle kill, and you can kind of tell from the color of the wood, you know, mm -hmm. it goes as it dies, it goes to different colors till it gets to that solid gray out there and, and just whites out and dies and gets blown over, you know, like that. So the, the younger that beetle kill is to where that sunlight comes in, unless that growth, you know, you still have that, that grass and stuff that's happening in there. You don't have the downfall in there. But it can be... Uh, <laughs> I, I know people that swear by beetle kill, like what Cole was saying, right? Man, there. that's why I like the, the mailboxes so much because I, you know, I learn on every podcast and, and even more when questions like this come up. So thank yeah. you, Joe, for, for the question. And, and Joe, we'd like to know what area you're in too. I mean, that'll help us, you know, tell you, um, get on your base map and, and pull that up and look uh, for other areas for them to bed if they're we not We won't disclose it. There. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just saying, you know, we're, we hunt in an area of Colorado or New Mexico or Wyoming. I, where, I guarantee you if it's you know, Beetle Kill, it's, it's Colorado oh, or Wyoming. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we went in an area of there in southern Wyoming that is just, it's unbelievable. How, Hammered. Yeah, it's its crazy. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to skip, we're going to skip, um, Toria, uh, I'll tad. We're going to skip his because him and I have talked, and I'm going to save that for the next one because okay. I want to make sure that we get this one because I think this is something that could help everybody. Um, RC, do you have that pulled up by any chance? That no, I don't have anything. Okay. All I got is you guys' picture. <laughs> okay, man. So this is uh, awesome. <laughs> Carrie Stewart. And Carrie says, I've looked at other pictures of elk feeding or at a water hole. And he was talking to me, so this was tied to me. He said, you say to aim three or four inches past the crease line coming up from the elbow at mid body to get a double lung shot broadside. I see the dot on your pictures. Could you please draw a line on the crease and elbow on a picture of an elk for me? Just so I'm clear, I have been practicing shooting when I can. Thank you. So in other words- the base camp, baby. Yeah, put your yeah. money where you <laughs> put your money down and watch the base. Camp. You can also go back to a podcast that Joe did in in our archives where it's about shot placement. Man, it's awesome. There he has and look it. at what there he got it. Joe's already ahead of me, man. Check it out. Yeah. So if if you mm -hmm. if you look at this, man, um, what I've done here is and. You know, you can see a crease on an animal, but it's so easy just to go straight up the back of that leg, straight up the back of that leg, go mid body, three inches back from straight up from that back of that leg right in there. I guarantee you, you put that arrow right there, you put that arrow right there, that critter, you're going to double lung that critter. You're so going to watch you him die. You get a heavy arrow. You're going to get to punch. see him fall over. I'm going to tell you yeah. right now. Or you yep. get a heavy arrow and punch right through all the bones on that side. <laughs> <laughs> Go right ahead and try that on one of them big elk femurs, bud. Let's see what happens. Now, here, here's the one thing I do want to say, though, is it when you guys do this, pay attention to the legs. 
because if you yeah, if this leg right here that. was way back over here yeah that means yeah. that we've got a quartering animal yeah. right if yeah. if you Which have the that, bottom one we do have a quartering animal yep yeah bottom one you got him slightly quartering well, it, and it could be because he's stepping forward and he's stepping back right here but yeah it it, it it could be what's happening there but if he's turned to a point so that i'm seeing this leg back here enough i'm actually aiming for that leg on that opposite side mm -hmm. so anytime you have an animal that's quartering away from you do not use the onside leg use the leg on the opposite side if you have a quartering away animal that's that's huge that's a huge tip for you man because that way you make sure you get both lungs and not just one lung all right yeah and i like i like where you got it there joe too because if you're at center if you're a little high i promise you Two to three inches high, your money. I'm going to tell you, there's a big globule of, of, you can, you of can arteries right that there. go through there. Yes. You can hit right there. You can hit right there. Any of them. Right there, there. Yeah. Gold, man. Joe, on the bottom picture, wouldn't you shoot, like, wouldn't your blue dot be more towards where the cross is? No. no. I'm going to hit him right there. No, right. I'm going to send it. I'm going to say it, buddy. It's kind of quartering towards, right? No, actually, if you look at it so that both legs are back like this, I just think it's the way he's stepping right there. He's got a little bit of quarter. A little quarter. quarter. But, mm -hmm. but not enough for me to worry about that because mm -hmm. those ribs back here are going to right here, man. They're 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 yeah. right in here. So me oh, yeah, that, man. Hey, you got from where the ex, from where the intersection is, you got a dang near a foot. I mean – 10 solid inches behind that to get him in alone. Now, you put a, you could put a basketball there I right at the intersection. You. Luis, if I saw six inches, eight inches uh, of depth between right. these legs right here, heck yeah, I'm shooting. Then right you there. would, yeah, then right. you'd want to get it yeah. to the crease. Right, right. Yeah. But, but, but even if you, on that shot, even if you hit where that cross is, it's still going to be as lethal. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But wiggle a little I'm left. That is somebody wiggle can... a little left. Yeah. You can yeah, control it. With a heavy blue, arrow. You, yeah. Not with a heavy arrow, you don't you have to. You better have one. arrow thing, man. Shoot them right here. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't care how adult you are, man. You just shoot that puppy right there. Mm -hmm. both I've got a shoulder blade in the freezer. I'll shoot with my heavy arrow set up and see how it, how it works out. Yeah. You know, and I'm God telling you, bless, it man, out. but I, I don't, uh, again, I don't want to guess. I don't want to assume. I don't want, I want to drop this critter. So that's, yeah, that's you know. Know. I like the pictures, Joe. And, and, and Very I think good. that's, I mean, it's super helpful to have it showing like that. So I hope, I well, hope Carrie, Carrie enjoys that. Spots. So Carrie, check yeah. out the YouTube video because uh, Joe has broken it down for you, brother. So, Poria, we'll get yes. yours next time out of Arizona, man. Gilbert, why don't you close us out, man? Man, as usual, Joe, fantastic content. We got all the brand new coaches in the house, along with our elder statesmen in the house. It's been so cool to have the legend RC Knox with us. It's so good to have our brother back with us here in Elk Camp, and he's, always he's good to see. He's in witness protection, though. He's in witness. <laughs> yeah, <protection. laughs> he's with sec. He's with sec. I got you. Man, it's, it's always good to have Chav with us. Hey, Guys, I'm no, back. <laughs> what? He was back for just a split of a second. I was back for a second. Oh, man, I'm sorry, RC. Uh, yeah, it's, it's always good to have our, our awesome elk hunting coaches in the house. Glad to see everybody. Uh, our new elk hunting coach, uh, we welcome, welcome, brother. Uh, we, we love to have you in. And uh, as as always, guys, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe, rate, and review us. You got to go to the podcast or iTunes to review us, and you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com. Just a reminder: if any of our listeners would like their questions answered on our show, just send your questions to info at elkbros.com. That's I-N-F-O at elkbros.com. And like we say down here in the Lone Star State, husbands, kiss your wives. Wives, kiss your husbands. Hug your babies. Keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry. And we'll see you next week right here on Blue Collar Elk Hunt. And he's back too, guys. Here's some music from our brother, Tony Winter. Tony Winter. Oh, yeah, big show. Tony. Yeah. Salute. Peace. See ya. <laughs> I get my goods from the river and woods. I get my highs climbing a mountainside. I get my life on a family.
family strong. In the fall, I'm gonna get my elk on. At daylight, I'm sitting just right, about to let an arrow fly. I get my goods from the river and the woods. I get my goods from the river. Rod, get my drift on at the tail out. He's cranking on the tip. Boy, I'm about to rip some lips. Yeah. I get my goods from the river and the woods. I get my highs climbing a mountainside. I get my Strong, going way deep with my pack on, and base camp with the base and view, and mountain house meals gonna get me through. I get my goods from the river. Strong. I'm living off the land all year long. 